Okay, uh, we can go ahead and get started then. Uh, my name is Richard Lipkin. Uh, I'm in the New York cohort for Fellowship AI. Uh, the presentation today is on dynamic routing between capsules and matrix, ca matrix capsules by with EM routing, which are two descriptions of the um, architecture of CNNs by Jeffrey Hinton, Sarah Sabor, and Nicholas Frost. This is a picture of Jerry, uh, Jeffrey Hinton. And they have just a different type of um, capsules and a different type of routing in the two papers. So first we can um, just discuss in the most basic sense, what is a capsule as opposed to what a neuron does. So um, a single neuron basically represents the likelihood of detecting just a specific feature. Like if we have a, a school bus, we could say, okay, is there a lot of yellow in this image? Um, whereas a capsule captures both the likelihood of detecting a feature and also some parameters. So it's not just one single activation. There's also uh, the ability to capture some other information here. So um, to discuss what a capsule network does, we can discuss sort of the idea of inverse graphics and computer graphics. And some of these slides are from Aurelien Giron's presentation, which is available on YouTube and is very good. Um, so in computer graphics, you basically start with uh, whatever instantiation parameters, you know, a rectangle or a triangle, like a polygon, the angle it's at, the size, uh, the location, and then you can render that to create a, an image which will appear on a computer. Um, or if you start out with the image uh, and you want to determine what the instantiation parameters were, what the parameters are of the rectangle and triangle that generated this image, you can do what a capsule network does. A capsule network is essentially a CNN that performs inverse rendering. Um, so our goal in these analyses is going to be doing this uh, left arrow process here. So uh, the outputs are vectors that with both the presence and, the, or, and the, the parameters, they can be the orientation or skew or size or thickness, whatever. Um, and the activations can have you know, as many dimensions as we want. So um, in order to illustrate the utility of these capsule networks, we can ask ourselves a quick thought experiment, um, will the network detect a human face? So if we have this above right picture or the left picture of a Picasso, uh, will a CNN detect a human face here? Well, you know, we're re representing the likelihood only. So, well, we have a left eye, we have a right eye, you know, we have a mouth, what's not to like, right? Um, but if we have a caps net, uh, then we re we're representing both the likelihood, the orientation and the size of all of these features. So we can see down at the bottom, uh, the likelihoods match up, but the orientations don't match up. The size is a bit messed up. So you can see that the probability that we actually have a uh, face here is only 0.1. Um, whereas with a CNN, we would assign that as 0.95 in the thought experiment. So here we can see um, the architecture of basically capsules. Um, this is what the primary capsules look like. And this is how we generate the primary capsules. So if we start out with the image on the right, which is just our little image of a boat, then we can apply a couple of convolutional layers and reshape it into vectors by dimensions for each location. So here we generate two vectors per location. So we generate the rectangle vector and the triangle vector for each location. And then we squash them. So uh, the squashing function is down in the center, and basically it just means that we output a value between 0 and 1, very close to 1 if the object is present, close to 0 if it's not present. And the orientation is uh, the orientation. So um, the main feature that this ensures that we preserve is called equivariance, which is the preservation of uh, detailed information about object location and pose. You see there's only one of these um, uh, rectangle vectors that is way longer than the others, and one triangle vector way longer than the others. That means that's probably where the rectangle and the triangle are. Um, so to illustrate equivariance with our little face example, we can see that in a CNN, you know, we cannot represent all angles of the face neuron with just one neuron. We need 
a zero degree face neuron, a plus 20 degree face neuron, and a minus 20 degree face neuron. Whereas with a face capsule, we just know that we have a face with 0.9 probability, and then we can change this value of angle over here to represent these equal affine transformations of all these different component parts. Um, so another way to say this is, of course, with cat pictures. Um, a caps net, uh, we don't need separate example or separate capsules for all levels of the affine transformation. So we can have all levels of the cat rotation capsule represent, you know, all the cats at different rotations. So um, the important thing about caps nets that is really convenient is that they represent sort of a hierarchy of parts. So if we have those uh, rectangle and triangle capsules we were talking about in level L, layer L, then in layer L plus one, we might have a boat capsule if they are at a certain orientation that agrees with each other. Um, and of course, in the upper right, we can see the hierarchy of parts for cats and doges. And on the next slide, we can see, so if we have a house, you know, then we will have just a different um, hierarchy of parts, even if we have the exact same size of the rectangle and the triangle. So we'll be able to describe the location and the orientation of the house or a boat, depending on the respective uh, relationships between the rectangle and the triangle. Um, so once we generate the primary capsules, we can pause to say that next, the primary capsules will predict the next layer's output. And that's very important to understand. So because we've been instructed to go slow, we can say pause here and think about that for a second. We're going to predict the next layer's output. So we're going to have each of the rectangle and the triangle capsules predict the outputs of the house and the boat capsule. Um, so what we do, and so here on the right, upper right, we have sort of features that are common between the cat and the doge. Um, whereas, okay, so on the rest of the slide, we have the rectangle capsule on the lower left, and on the upper left, we have the house capsule and the boat capsule. So we see where the rectangle capsule is. So we have this activation here for the rectangle capsule. So we can predict where the triangle will be if it's a house, and we can have the rectangle capsule predict where the triangle will be if it is a boat. And we do that during, uh, and that, that's uj pi i, which is the prediction. So we find that using the transformation matrix, um, and we multiply it by the capsule zone activation vector ui. And so the transformation matrix is what we learn um, for each pair of capsules in these two layers. Um, so we can uh, now find an example of routing by agreement. So in the upper left here, the uh, black parts of the black shapes are what's actually there, and the white parts are the predicted. So you can see that on the left, if we're, if we're routing them to the house capsule, we do not have agreement in what the rectangle and triangle capsules predict for what the house capsule will uh, look like. Whereas on the right, we see if we, if we have the rectangle predict where the triangle is going to be for the boat, and we have the triangle predict where the rectangle is going to be for the boat, we have strong agreement with, um, you know, between the two different predictions. And that's what we call routing by agreement. So from that, we're going to conclude that the boat is correct and that any routing to the capsules for the house is not desirable, it's just noise. And so here on the right, upper right, we have uh, the cat and the doge sort of discriminative examples on the, on the bottom left. You have a cat ear and a cat whiskers, which can help discriminate. Um, so the features that this uh, routing by agreement provides are sort of clean inputs, very simple hierarchy of parts, and we, it helps us to parse crowded scenes, which we'll see in a sec. So um, the way we're routing by clusters of agreement, the iter it's iterative. So we can illustrate it like this with axis values. So on the y-axis here, we have size, and x-axis, we have rotation. So the dots are votes of the first level capsules, so votes of triangle and rectangle capsules. And the mean is basically like a grand prediction for the boat capsule. 
Um, so the dots of the first level predictions and the iterative training sort of increases the weights of the values close to the mean. You first find the mean and then you change the weights and uh, increasing them close to the mean. Then you update the mean, which means you update the cross in the direction of this arrow. And so you can repeat this for a few iterations until you're happy with the results. Um, so in a bit more detail, um, before you do all this, you actually have to set all the routing weights equal to zero and then do a softmax. So before we start with um, determining whether we have a boat or a house, we set all the predicted outputs to 0.5. So the horizontal rows here have to add up to one. So the house plus boat outputs have to equal one. So um, that's the process here is the softmax uh, following the assignment of all equal weights. So then um, after that, we uh, predict the next layer's weights in the way we, in the matrix multiplication method that we described. Um, so we get a weighted sum for each capsule in the next layer and each capsule in the next layer will receive all the ones in its receptive field. And then we squash it to get a, a probability between zero and one, so all the probabilities add up to one, and then that will give us the first round of outputs. So then we assess the agreement. Um, and the way we assess the agreement is by taking the product of uji, which is the predicted output vector, and we multiply it by the actual product vector vj. Um, so the raw routing weight is changed by that much. So when we detect agreement, then we will have a large product because the angle will saturate at one. The cosine um, will be, you know, saturating at one because the angle between them will be almost zero. Um, so then after one round, you see after we apply these um, updated probabilities, um, we've already pretty much ruled out the house and we've chosen the boat. Um, so after we're satisfied, we could do another iteration now, but if we're satisfied, uh, when we're satisfied, we can proceed to the next layer. Um, and so uh, about handling crowded scenes, which we mentioned before, um, the routing by agreement is a very powerful method to deal with this. So we could ask ourselves, um, do we have an upside down house here on this image on the right? You know, but okay, so but if we counted that as an upside down house, then we would not be able to see the right side up house and we would not be able to see the boat. And so we would not be able to, we, we would have a triangle and a rectangle. We would not be able to explain if we explained the center as an upside down house. So you see the activation vectors here on the lower left, they're going to change so that we have one house and one boat in the house boat layer. Um, and that, and the upside down um, house didn't appear because then we would have had an orphan triangle and an orphan um, rectangle. Uh, so one other feature of these networks is called regularization by reconstruction. Um, and so to understand that, we have to understand that they added a decoder network. So the decoder network is very simple. It's just three fully connected layers and a sigmoid activation function. So um, we use that to reconstruct the image and then we penalize using the margin loss, which we'll see on the next slide, plus alpha times the reconstruction loss. Um, the reconstruction loss is the difference, the squared difference between the reconstructed and input images. So because we penalize that, we force the network to preserve detailed information. And we also sort of reduce overfitting because we're uh, forcing it to be able to reconstruct the original image. So this functions as sort of like a regularizer. Um, and then this is, this on this next slide, we have the margin loss on the uh, bottom right, which uh, is, it looks slightly confusing the way it's written, but if you translate it to English, it's actually very, very sensible and simple, which basically says that if the object is present, then its um, presence vector, sort of its probability vector length should be 0.9 or more, if not, if it's not present, uh, then the uh, length probability vector should be less than 0.1. If not, we assess a penalty. Um, and for classes where the digit is not actually present, that penalty has to be downweighted by a factor called lambda. And lambda is just a factor that prevents us from 
reducing all the weights by too much because we have lots of um, digits where, or lot, we have lots of cases where it's the object is not actually present and relatively few whether the ob, where the object is present. So we have to downweight the losses for the classes where the object is not present. Because like, for example, in the MNIST, we would have a nine to one discrepancy between ob objects not present versus present, or eight to one, if we're talking about the multi-MNIST data set. Um, so this is the, uh, the architecture of, uh, oh, and uh, I guess uh, on the above right, we have the full routing algorithm, but we've already discussed all the steps. Um, in figure one, we have the architecture of a simple caps net. Um, on the left, we have a couple of first conf layers, and then we reshape the outputs to get the primary capsules. Then the primary capsules are in a grid, um, and then the we have to output, we have a digit caps layer, which is fully connected to the 10 output capsules, which are for the MNIST data set, 10 digits, 10 capsules. And the um, capsule the output capsules contain 16 D vectors. So we have 16 output dimensions, and we'll see one of them in a minute. We'll, we'll see some of them in a minute. Um, and then down bo uh, on bottom, we have the uh, architecture of the reconstruction um, method, uh, the decoder network, which honestly, there's really not much to say about it. It's just um, two fully connected ReLU layers and a sigmoid. Um, the outputs of uh, 784 channels are 28 by 28 of the pixel values in the MNIST data set. So here is um, a few of the dimensions we were just mentioning. So if we take um, dimensions and perturb them, and then we run the perturbed values through the reconstruction network, then we can see how the dimensional perturbations affect the appearance of the digit. So we can see that um, if we um, perturb the dimensions, we have very clear perturbations of thickness, parts, um, stroke thickness, skewness, um, width. Uh, there's one, one dimension that describes width plus translation. And plus this localized part of the two, I guess the top part of the two can get longer or shorter. So we have a, a very descriptive um, nature of the 16 output dimensions, which is very helpful. Um, now, this, these models were used on the MNIST data set, uh, shifted up to two pixels in each direction, and they also created what I was discussing was the multi-MNIST data set. So that's uh, with uh, what they did to create the multi-MNIST data set was overlay two of the 28 by 28 images on top of each other after shifting them by up to four pixels. So the output uh, images are 36 by 36, and it's a very large data set, 1,000 samples per MNIST digit. Um, so the results indicated a 5% error rate um, on the MNIST, which is the double reconstructions. That they felt that that was a very good error rate. They, they can um, reconstruct both of the two um, images 95% of the time. Um, the previous state of the art was Ba et al. 2014, uh, which was about the same error rate, but they had a task with a lot less overlap. Um, and so we can see um, the MNIST data set error rate was only 0.25%, which it was a, a new state of the art. Um, at the time, I believe. Um, but the next, uh, the next version of their paper has an improved version of that result. Um, so now down on the lower right hand of this side, of this slide, we have some of the reconstructions. So you can see down on the left hand side, the network predicts and draws the two digits that are in the above images uh, perfectly. And then on the bottom right, we have like some problem examples, like you see on the 0, 08 example, it was unable to draw the zero because it was unable to attribute, um, I guess, parts of the image to it. It instead attributed them to the eight, so it was not able to draw those digits. Um, so that, that's kind of interesting is that it's not able to draw the digit at all, like for when it's supposed to draw a uh, seven, when a one and a six, or it tried to draw a seven and a six. Um, it actually drew just kind of a blob. Um, the CIFAR 10 results were not great, 10.6% error, but these haven't 
been refined uh, like CNN results have. And on something called the SVHN, they got a 4.3% error rate. Um, so now we can talk about the EM routing. This is the second paper, which is the expectation maximization algorithm. Um, so in the expectation maximization algorithm, each capsule contains a logistic presence unit and a four by four pose matrix. Now this is different from uh, this is different from the routing by agreement method because that in that method each capsule has a probability and an angle. So here we're dealing with a, a matrix instead of a vector. That, so that's the key difference. Um, so the pose matrices are designed to capture different viewpoints, and we have a good data set for that, which we'll see. So um, the active capsules are supposed to, like the face capsules, uh, are supposed to receive clusters of similar pose votes. So if the pose votes, if the pose uh, matrices are similar, then they're supposed to vote for a similar pose, and we're supposed to form a face capsule based on that. Um, so in the EM routing algorithm, we form um, sort of Gaussian distributions, and we minimize we sort of minimize those distributions. And the Gaussian distributions are essentially the predictions for the next layer. So um, we take uh, the pose matrix M and we multiply it by a transformation matrix W. The W, the transformation matrix, is what we learn from the training data. Mm -hmm. So this should look familiar to you in terms of multiplying it by the vector we saw before, but here we multiply it just by a pose matrix. Um, and again, we're grouping a hierarchy of parts. Here it's uh, facial features to faces. So here's a, on the upper left, we have sort of a, a, a picture of the Gaussian distributions being minimized. And on the bottom left, we have a, a model sort of sorting observations into the correct layer L plus one capsules. So we start with two Gaussian distributions and we recalculate their mean and their sigma, their variance values. So we determine the best fit of these distributions and we maximize the likelihood of the observed data points. So the higher layer capsule again is like the Gaussian. The lower layer caps, the lower layer capsule outputs are the little crosses we see here, the actual data points. Um, so we're trying to find um, however many clusters um, and trying to minimize that. And that's kind of like the k-means clustering algorithm, except a bit different. Um, so on this slide, we have the cost function and expectation maximization. And then on the um, next slide, we have the really long Greek version. So we, we can summarize the cost uh, as a dimensional sum. So it's uh, the cost in EM is the uh, sum of all dimensions H. And then the thing that we have to sum over all the dimensions is the negative probability of the density of the vote. So it's the negative probability distribution of the, um, of the pose matrix for dimension H. So we can get the activation function of capsule C as um, a function weighted by an inverse temperature parameter uh, and the difference between the mean of the lower level capsules and the cost. So here it is in significantly more arcane terms. And um, if there's someone, uh, if there's someone else who you know has anything to say about this version of it, feel free. Otherwise, I'm prepared. I'm prepared to just go with the plain English version. That <laughs> silence. Um, so. Uh, I guess we can go ahead and look at the, so here are the free energy functions that we're minimizing in different parts of the expectation maximization algorithm. Um, so when we're recomputing the Gaussian means and variances, um, we're reducing an energy that's equal to the assignment probabilities times the square distances of the votes from the means. Um, and then we also recalculate the capsule activations. So we minimize the energy, which is a sum of the scaled costs, which is from that logistic, uh, minus, but we have to subtract the entropy of the activation values. 
So when we have lots of activation values that are way different from each other, there is a certain disorder or entropy that's associated with that. So there's a certain like random fluctuation in the values and we have to subtract an entropy that results from that. Um, and so then we also recompute the assignment probabilities. So the assignment probabilities of the data point crosses to the Gaussian distributions or the higher level capsules. And so we sum those energies and then we also have to subtract the entropy of the assignment probabilities. Um, so the EM routing procedure is on this slide. And this is one of the ones where it actually sort of looks like a bear at first, but if you break it down, it's actually not that bad. So at first, we're gonna assign these RIJs, which are the assignment probabilities as uniform. We've already seen that. Um, so we're, it, and then the next couple, the lines uh, three, four, and five are just, we iterate through M and E steps T times, that's it. Okay, so the, in the M step, uh, we're recalculating the Gaussian model values and activations uh, based on the assignment probabilities. And then in E step, we, we recompute the assignment probabilities uh, based on the Gaussian model values. And then what we return is uh, the parent capsule outputs. And then, you know, we iteratively go through that until we're happy with the outputs and then we go on to the next layer. Um, and so on the bottom, we have the margin loss. So this is a new form of, sort of a new form of loss, but we've seen a very similar thing in the spread loss from before. So what it basically says is that the margin between a true label and a wrong class is supposed to be greater than M. If, it, if it's less, you know, so if it's less then we're, we're assigning, we're making an assignment to a wrong class, so penalize the uh, value by uh, M minus AT minus AI, which is the uh, activation um, minus the distance to the margin. So we're getting a presentation. So, I mean, so, I mean, we're, we're gonna have to be like another half hour. <laughs> um, anyway, so we're, uh, penalizing the margin between the true level and the wrong class um, by the difference between the activations. Um, so they created a data set um, called the small NORB data set, um, which is, well, actually they didn't create it. They actually took this data set offline. We have um, all lots of different toys at different viewpoints. Um, so we have grayscale images. All images in the first row are at azimuth zero and elevation zero. And then we have different azimuths, which are sort of like angles, tilt angles, and elevations, which are, you know, the, the elevation at which we're viewing them. Um, so we have lots of different elevations and azimuths. And our goal is to sort of cluster the outputs um, into the correct class. So on the training iterations one, two, and three above, you can see that we start out with sort of diffuse predictions like across the classes. So we have um, animal, human, plane, truck, and car. And by a couple of training iterations in, we have sort of eliminated the wrong classes, except on this third row with the airplane. So we have uh, activations for airplane and car. So we're only visualizing the distance of 0.5 from uh, from the, uh, we're only visualizing a distance of 0.05 uh, from our, uh, from the, the true value. So you can see that um, not all the clusters are, are visualized in all the histograms. So sort of more clusters appear in the correct um, bin as we go forward with our, our training iteration. So they got pretty good results classifying these um, small NORB results. We also have the small NORB EM uh, network architecture here. So each capsule has um, a four by four pose matrix um, plus a logistic activation unit. Uh, we have a, a ReLU con one layer which outputs the channels. So we, put, we, put, uh, we output the values through a normal convolutional layer to get the original capsules. Um, then um, the primary capsule layers 
um, have a, con a convolutional filter that transforms um, the, tra uh, the capsules into primary capsules. Uh, once we are finally to the last layer, we add the scaled coordinates of the receptive field center to the first two elements of the capsule's vote. So we, uh, we, have, we are preserving detailed spatial information by doing this. So we're actually conveying the information about where in the image uh, the center of the object is. Even though capsules in upper layers only send feedback to layer L capsules that are in their uh, receptive field. Um, now, um, in terms of EM routing, uh, in terms of the results from this, their best model here is on the uh, last row. So 1.4% error rate. The best prior reported result was 2.56. Um, they all, regular dynamic routing achieved a 2.7% error rate. So the difference between dynamic routing and EM routing really makes a big difference in this particular case. It reduces the errors by almost half. Um, they also ran a similar experiment with a smaller CAPSnet EM network. That one had one ninth the number of parameters, and that's the 2.2% above. So um, they can reduce the number of parameters by a lot and still achieve state-of-the-art results. Um, so down at the bottom, we have uh, a model where the uh, CNNs and capsules were matched on their error rates to familiar viewpoints. So it's really hard to tell how these models um, generalize to novel viewpoints when um, the capsule model is just way better at everything. So they, they found a data set where they matched the error rates and they found that still, even when the error rates between CNNs and capsules are the same, generalizing to novel viewpoints is still better for capsules. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, we also have uh, results about resistance to adversarial attacks. So um, for those who might not be aware, adversarial attacks uh, can be trained actually. So we can train a model to add random noise to an image to so that we essentially can minimize the loss for making a wrong prediction. So we add noise to an image that makes it so that the pixel values are messed up. And so we end up predicting something else. So we take a panda and we add noise and we end up with a given image. You know? um, so we can chart um, the uh, sort of resilience of capsule networks and CNNs to these types of attacks. So we on the left, we have accuracy after an adversarial attack. So the CNNs are in blue and green, and so they don't have much accuracy. On the right, we have success rate of an adversarial attack, and we have um, CNNs, you know, had uh, much higher success rates of the attacks on them. So attacks on CNNs are much more successful. So that means that capsule networks are more resilient. So we can go over just a couple of disadvantages of routing by agreement, which are addressed by uh, expectation maximization, some of which we already went over. Um, so one of them is representing the probability with a length of limit one, um, sort of reduces the effectiveness of routing and the authors call that in unprincipled nonlinearity. The other one which we've already gone over is that the cosine sort of saturates at one. So if we're measuring agreement by the cosine between two angles, then we're not really being sensitive to the difference between a good result and like a great result. So that's a, a problem that is addressed by using um, the pose matrix in EM. So um, because uh, routing by agreement uses a vector of length n uh, instead of a matrix with n elements to represent the pose. Um, the transformation matrix for routing by agreement has to have n squared parameters instead of n. So there's some uh, n rather than n squared scaling going on with expectation maximization too. Um, so now we can just go over a couple of advantages of caps nets um, over CNNs. So as we've already seen, um, caps nets preserve both position and pose. They preserve equivariance, the hierarchy of parts. 
and it's very easy to interpret the uh, activation vectors. So like in the upper, upper right, um, we can uh, plot the relationships here so that we can rotate out this R and find out that it's not actually an R. Whereas a CNN might say, okay, well, we have this loop, we have this line, what's not to like, just like with the Picasso image, and might conclude that we actually have an R. Um, so with caps nets, um, we have a weighted sum of features from the previous layer, whereas with CNNs, we use max pooling, so we throw away lots of features. We have only the max feature. Um, so uh, in caps nets, uh, they're very robust to affine transformations, like things like skewness, warping, things like that. Um, so they, uh, it, well, whereas with CNNs, as we've already seen, you know, we would need different neurons to represent the different rotations of a face. Um, so for, because of things like that, um, we would need a grid of feature detectors that grows exponentially. So like, for example, with the face, you know, we would need one neuron, one cap, we would, we, need, we would need one neuron for each rotation of the face. So if we want to capture more dimensions, we would need to, the number of feature detectors to go up exponentially. Um, so disadvantages of caps nets. They don't have the best performance on larger images, like uh, CIFAR-10 has a really varied background and image net images um, have, you know, just larger size. Um, fully connected networks generally do not scale well to larger images. And so um, I guess one thing, I haven't really um, actually run many caps nets myself, but one thing I did run, one thing I did run into in my meager experiments with them is that um, training is kind of slow, slower than CNNs. Um, and the source of the slowness is sort of the routing by agreement algorithm. Um, and uh, I guess, so one thing to note though is all of these algorithms are kind of fast. I mean, there are many computational tasks out there which require way more computational power than caps nets. So the, the slow training isn't that big of an issue. Um, the other disadvantage of caps nets is that they can't detect two really close objects that are identical. Um, that's a phenomenon called crowding. Um, so now we have the comparisons with previous work. Um, up uh, first, we have Cohen and Welling, 2016, uh, Dieleman et al, 2016, and other authors have created CNNs that have rotational equivariance. So they've, they've inserted sort of the rotation parameter into CNNs. And then we also have um, spatial transformer networks. So one of the papers is the Jaderberg et al from 2015. So this is sort of a, a normalization method, which does CNN sampling according to affine transformation. So on the right, you, you can see uh, an image of how this is done in spatial transformer networks. So we have the incoming image and then we outline, we have the spatial transformer network will outline the part it thinks it wants, and then it will apply a rotation or an affine transformation to get out what it thinks is the image in sort of a base viewpoint. So the difficulties uh, include the fact that they can't really deal with lots of different transformations because they try to represent everything in this base viewpoint and sort of a native viewpoint, whereas capsule networks are happy to deal with, you know, various different degrees of activations uh, with viewpoint. Um, there were also some other papers that adapted uh, spatial transformer network filters during training, so they uh, applied different filters at different points during the training. Um, but capsules do not use filters at all. They, they take care of it with this EM routing or routing by agreement. And then the images at the top here are from harmonic networks. So they use circular harmonic filter and they return a maximal response and orientation. So you see on the left, on this upper right image here, the left panel has the output from a CNN. So they will have to out, they will have to these are all outputs from different neurons as it goes around a rotational circle. On the right, we have the same 
um, activation at a different rotation. So you can see it's much more consistent between the viewpoints with harmonic networks. Um, so other previous work, we have symmetry networks, which sort of maps um, low level pose information to high level pose information, but it always starts with the same pose. Um, we can also sort of comment on the validity of um, the dynamic routing procedure in terms of biological models, which I guess they're saying, you know, it's pretty similar to how the brain works, which I would, I guess I would agree with. Um, this is also related to work on attention mechanisms, but in some work on attention mechanisms, um, Gaussian kernels have been used to attend to different parts of a feature map, whereas here we have attention in the opposite direction. So we have competition between higher level capsules for uh, the attention of the lower level features. The bottom line is research on capsule networks is now where CNN research was, you know, probably at the beginning of this century. Um, so for implementations, we have a whole bunch. The official one is Sarah Sabor's. We also have Jifeng Guo's. And ones like Jifeng Guo's, um, they all have like really helpful articles along with them. There's really lots of information out there about capsule networks. You know, if you care to look for it, they have like, you know, really handheld implementations. So it's very easy to get started. Um, and we also have lots of other papers. There have only been two years since, less than two years since uh, the 2017 paper came out, yet there are all these papers now. Um, and oh, yeah. we, for example, um, we have the uh, lung cancer screening apps net here on the upper right. And please, if you're not speaking, mute your mic. Um, so on the top uh, row, we have the original images um, for lung cancer here. And then reconstruction by cap, the original caps net is on the second row. Reconstruction by their caps net is on the third row. So you can see there is significant scope to change the parameters of these caps nets so that they can accommodate, you know, different types of reconstructions. Um, in case you don't like, we have lots of videos, and you can search the internet for uh, YouTube videos on this topic, and there's, some of them are very good. The really and Jerome ones are highly recommended. Uh, and then we have a couple of uh, clearing houses of curated links here, um, which some of the links there are really good, and that's all I got. Um, so I guess if anyone has anything, any, uh, any, any comments? From a, uh, 